Okay, let's uh, make a start. Uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Alison Breeze, who is archivist at the um, to the City Council Archives. And her talk, fascinating topic, What Lies Beneath? And I won't say any more than that. <laughs> Alison, thank you. and thank you for all coming out on this miserable night. Um, I've been working at Dunedin City Council Archives for the last 15 years, and this topic originally came out of public inquiries. Um, people tried to remember where they were, and my first question was, what, what underground toilets? And things like that. So as time went on, I got known as the toilet expert, asked Alison, she'll know about them. She's been doing stuff about them. And it snowballed from there, and I regularly give talks on this topic, and last year I decided to sign up and uh, do my masters on it. Um, so I'm part way through my part time masters on this very topic, looking at why the superstructures declined in Dunedin. And it's all based on the Dunedin conveniences. And um, I will show you some of the work we're doing through council to promote this built heritage. So the very first public facilities provided were by, built by the Dunedin Town Board, which was the Dunedin City Council predecessor. They ran for 10 years, from 1855 to 1865. They were classed as a bit of a disaster. No um, resources from government. They struggled with people. They had to do all the roads, the fire stations, the lights, the town belt, everything. And the gold rush happened in the middle. So they lost all their staff as well, with people flowing in. So the very first um, toilet was right where that blue arrow is, which is in the exchange round about where Carver's Monument sits right now. And so that two-storey building was the fire station, and it was built, uh, was requested to be built by the Tuggeru Provincial Council, and then ta the town board said, well, we, can we have the top floor, please? And so they moved into the top floor and built a urinal, public urinal beside it, which had its own attendant as well at that stage. And apparently it was disgusting. And so this is an example of the entry in our uh, letter books at work in our basement in the Octagon. Um, 1861 requesting that a public water closet can be built on the beach reserve, which is that where the exchange is now and the water used to come right up to. So this photo of the triangle, or the Queen's Gardens, as it is now, so this was taken to show the planting of like the First Amenity Society planting in this area, and it's from De Papa, and they've got fantastic digital collections, and when you zoom in, you get these um, views. And I was looking for this one, and I spotted this building, and this is a typical public urinal that was built through from the 1860s to about the 1890s for men in the city. And this one sat on that corner for quite some time. It just gets um, overshadowed by trees as time goes on. So by 1906, there were 10 public conveniences in the city, all for men. So it became quite a topic at council minute level, and um, they were described as particularly unpleasant places and other councillors labelled them as a disgrace. So although local department stores provided rest areas for women when they went shopping, there was no public conveniences for women before 1908. Women were not considered to be out, of the, out in the public space as much as men. They were meant to be at home, looking after children, getting the house in order, and so they were seen as being less in need of convenience. So the very first toilets built um, by four women by the Dunedin City Council were in the tramways building at St Clair Beach in 1908. So this was a really popular family destination once tram travel became really popular. It was very respectable to go out to the beach with your family. You could stay in the tea rooms and you could have a cup of tea and use the toilets. Um, it's also an economic benefit for the tea room owner as well if people could stay a bit longer. This is the shot of the Octagon Men's Undergrounds, which some of you may remember. 
So by 1909, uh, Dunedin City Council decided to build two underground conveniences in Dunedin. So there was a lot of general concern about uh, cleanliness and hygiene in the city, and this sort of came around after the 1901 um, bubonic plague scare across the world. There's a lot of concern that this wasn't helping things. Dunedin was meant to be away from the old world, and we were going back the same way. And so the new convenience was seen as a matter of urgency. So they were first discussed in 1900, where a private company put forward an idea that they would build them for the city. Um, they would charge and take all the charges, and if council gave them free electricity and free um, plumbing and drainage. So that didn't fly, didn't go at all, and it was not until 1910, so remember this is a real matter of urgency, 10 years later, however the money was appropriated to the cause. So they managed to um, get some uh, money set aside for these uh, toilets. So two locations were picked, um, this, both because they're central to the city and because of their seclusion was the idea. The first selected site was the Lower Octagon Reserve under the Chapman's Monument or Thomas Burns Monument and the second was under the back of the Cargill's Monument in the Exchange or Custom House Square as it was then. So the very first underground conveniences in the world were built in 1855 in London and flush toilets came into public use in the following decade. So Dunedin's new subterranean facilities were seen as very modern um, up to date with trends in Europe, which was very important, and perhaps most importantly, they were going to be out of sight. And so this here is a, um, one of the amazing plans we have in the archives, um, all beautifully watercoloured. So as well as being practically invisible, Dunedin's underground conveniences or comfort stations, as they were known, were designed to be aesthetically pleasing. The interiors to the Octagon facilities were fitted with wall-to-wall -wall white ceiling tiles. They had ornamental skirting um, dados and they were rich with um, beautiful green tiles at the top. Um, they had electric heaters, electric ventilation systems, and they had mirrors installed as well. So these are two shots of the ladies' entrance of them being used, the mother with her children. So the ladies' entrance here was a particular source of pride for one local engineer. So the passage into it was all sheltered by shrubbery for privacy, which is very important. In a 1919 report, which these photos come from, he commented that there should be more of this type of convenience around the city for women. The gentlemen's conveniences were open from 7am to 11pm at night daily, and the ladies had shorter opening hours than the men's, from 8.30 and they closed at 9pm. So within months of opening, these two underground toilets uh, had over 46,000 patrons in the month. So there was a bit of a need. This is an example of a catalogue from Twyford's in uh, England. So the urinals and water closets uh, for the undergrounds were imported by the Dunedin contractors, of which there were two for each one, both from the Twyford company in England. Now they had worked really closely with Thomas Crapper in England for the first flush toilet, so they, were, they are movers and shakers in the sanitary health world, and they still run today as a bathroom um, company as well. So they had been involved in those first designs of flush toilets. So the Octagon uh, site had 10 urinals, 4 water closets and lavatory, which in those days meant the sink uh, for men, and the women had 4 water closets and the lavatory and both had accommodation for an attendant. So the cost for the water closets was a penny. Spend a penny saying comes from that. Although the men's urinals were free. So um, this system um, was worldwide, very uh, popular with councils, not so much with the public. Um, there were higher charges for extra services such as permission to use the looking glasses. And in one four-week period, the, um, the convenience raised £28 for the council. So they're making quite a bit of money. And just to show you um, some footage here, this is the exchange or Custom House Square in 1912. And you can see the sheer amount of people. And if you look at the very left, 
you'll see people using the undergrounds. But this is um, just the day in the life in 1912. You see people going down the stairs. This is the only film footage I've got. <laughs> But you can see the demand that there's that many people milling around on the street on an average day. The Stock Exchange building, long gone. And the trains ploughing through there. <laughs> so this is a shot of the um, the second site, and this one actually opened first because the tiles arrived quicker on the ship, so it opened first. Um, and this was in Custom House Square. So this one was for men only, and it was located around the back under the Cargill's Monument. And this was the busiest by far of the three undergrounds. It had 10 urinals, two water closets, and accommodation for an attendant. So this was the only convenience that really caused council any issues. Cargill's monument was often a site for orators and political speeches on the, the raised stairs there. So it made it difficult sometimes to go and use the toilets. The city engineer did note, however, that uh, people were quite happy to sit around and discuss the events of the day on the site, as you can see. If you look at any old photos um, right throughout the whole development of Denise, there's always men sitting on that monument, standing around chatting. Um, so they were quite happy to, so they weren't put off being by near the underground convenience was the idea. Um, so a 1919 report noted that the Custom House Square also um, was a problem because of bar treatment. So there's this fantastic report that says complaint has been made lately of a nuisance on the station itself. When the closing hour of the adjacent pubs arrived, gentlemen who have been undergoing bar treatment come out into the street. The treatment is said to affect their minds and paralyse their bodies to some extent. They fill up the underground place and are complained of as bringing in alcoholic pandemonium of vulgarity, obscenity and blasphemy to the loathing and disgust of the officer in charge, the attendant, and all untreated persons within hearing. The paralysis of the, paralysis of the gastric nerves due to the bar treatment causes some to empty their stomachs about the place. But the mess is immediately cleaned up and no complaint comes from the surface. <laughs> so this was the real problem one. All of them had these types of issues. <coughs> Some things need to change. Um, and so this is the plan of the Custom House Square one. You can see it's a bit smaller than the other ones. And then this is uh, what is termed as a drainage plan, so it's a bit more sketchy, but it actually shows very quickly the next year they built an extension on it, uh, the coloured bit on the end, because they realised it wasn't big enough, and they needed more room for an attendant. So the third underground toilet, they managed to um, work out they had a little bit more money, so they thought they would go for a third <coughs> underground, which is just up the street in London Street, opposite what is now known as the Bowl. Um, it's the Albert Ellis Hotel, and so this was for men's only as well. So while these uh, subterranean spaces were designed with modernity and privacy, uh, the challenges of being underground meant they had to be constructed um, in certain engineering ways to withstand things like the traffic load. The traffic load. They had to. The roof had to be designed to meet that traffic load. This one here, because it's not under a monument, does have traffic rattling right over the top of it. And um, the floors and walls and ceilings needed to be watertight to hold back the water table and rainwater on days like today. Um, water from the street had to be stopped from running down the stairs. And when it did flood, the water had to be pumped back out. So artificial light was also required. So this is a plan of it. Um, with all the spaces having skylights and pavement lights as well. Another great shot of the London Street toilets. And so these were closed um, in 1964. Uh, they were reported as being generally deteriorate, deteriorated and <coughs> they were seen as quite inadequate for the area. It was a very busy area in this um, block. Uh, and so they were officially shut in 1964. They were offered to other departments within council and the electricity department said they would take it um, for an underground substation which is still there today. 
So if you go just up the road there and look, there's a big plate in the ground that is the underground um, toilet space. Um, we've got no record of any of the stuff being taken out of it, but it's clearly been stripped of all its tiles and the inside of it, because it's just a concrete bunker now. So that's not me going down there, I wasn't allowed to. Um, Delta took those photos for me. So, um, by 1919, council were being uh, pressured to build more underground toilets and to build more for women. Uh, the public were writing in saying, we need these toilets. There was one, this is Manor Place toilet, still stands today. Um, there was a toilet before this one, and uh, all the local businesses wrote into council, which we've got, and signed this petition saying, you've got to do something about it, it's disgraceful, it needs to be fixed up, and still note none for women. So they said, please could you make this one an underground for men and women. Council didn't do that. Um, they built this above ground one for men only in 1912. Now you've got a price difference of about, even with the junk, need to convert it, but about £200 to build this. The undergrounds were about £3,500 to build, or up to £5,000 to build. So this is much, much cheaper. And so this one here was described by our city engineer in 1919 as an object of beauty, draped as, a, as, a, as in lovely native shrubs. <laughs> so the shrubs feature. So the shrubs added that um, important concealment um, for people who were worried that people were going to see them. So all these um, toilets all were covered in shrubs all the time. So there was a King Edward Street um, public conveniences that were built the same year above ground. Uh, these are opposite the Mayfair Theatre now. It's now the Corrections Department. It's not even a road anymore. It used to be Bow Street or Bow Lane. And it's now not a street at all. So Cargill's Corner's just, just up a bit. So they were um, situated uh, there for quite a few years and they had a visiting attendant, no one on site. <coughs> So a nearby property owner, when these were first pitched to be built, tried to call a halt to this, to the construction of them, because um, it was nearby his brand new building. So his lawyers, um, there's a person coming in or out, I'm not sure, his lawyers advised the Lean City Council that the, their client felt disgraced and did not want his lady's customers' eyes and noses offended by this being so close to his area. And the building owner made a request that council will not carry out the intention of erecting so nasty a place in such close proximity to his premises. They built it anyway. Um, and what happens all throughout time is that everyone wants these public toilets, just not near them. And so that is always a problem. Whenever they pick a site for any of these toilets, someone writes in and complains. So as well as underground and above ground conveniences, the council also provided semi underground conveniences. So uh, you can see the top one there down Jetty Street. It's an above ground one, like the one at the Triangle, right in the middle of the intersection. That moved to further up in the middle of the street. And that was to provide convenience for people attending the shows, the winter shows at the Agricultural Hall and at His Majesty's Theatre. So it was situated right in the middle of the street. It was two-way streets in the street in those days, and these toilets caused headaches for patrons and council alike, as patrons keep exiting up the stairs straight into oncoming traffic. So um, there was only a raised concrete path around it, no railing, and people often didn't know which way to look, and they were hit, and um, a lot of injuries resulted from these toilets. We've got some reports about a truck ramming into the structure, causing extensive damage to both the truck and the structure. Um, it was suggested to build a railing around it uh, to prevent people walking out in it. So these opened in 1924, and by 1949 they were closed because they caused too many problems. So the underground conveniences all had attendants stationed in them. Uh, for some, this was um, quite a dangerous position as quite a lot of assaults happened um, in the toilets. We've got quite a lot of records of um, them being beaten up in some of them. Um, it was still quite a popular job. We have all the original job applications for the attendants. Uh, these are the ones from 1910. And uh, there was a prerequisite that all staff had to be ex-employees of the corporation or widows of ex-employees for the women's toilets. 
So there was a perimeter around it, but they still got quite a lot of um, applications. So the New Zealand South Seas Exhibition at Logan Park, as we know now, um, saw the first ever women's restroom and crash committee providing a facility for visitors at the exhibition. So this was a huge exhibition. It had over 3 million visitors over the year, and it had a fun factory, as it was known, a fun, fun park at the back. And that's where you took your children and things like that. So this uh, committee set up the first restroom. And once the event all wrapped up and it was all pulled down, um, it, that restroom was donated to the Botanic Gardens of the city. So during the 1920s, the restroom became very popular. It was run by um, various women's groups all com coming together, and they provided a lot more services than the undergrounds. So this is just an example of uh, some of the services that you get. You paid for them, but you got... Um, all this type of service. You could sit and just relax somewhere in a proper restroom. Hot water for heating babies bottles. Um, people could help you get the prams up the stairs if there were stairs, because that was one big issue with the undergrounds. Access was a real problem. You couldn't get your pram down the stairs of the undergrounds. Um, so this is what um, started becoming really popular, and this was a sort of worldwide movement as well. So. In 1950, the Athenaeum restroom opened, if anyone remembers those, they ran for quite a few years, and as soon as they opened, the women's underground shut. So they decided that, uh, no, they, they knew that no one would use the undergrounds once, <laughs> that the restrooms across the road would open, and um, they decided to trial it at night time when the restrooms were closed, and I think over a three year period they had 13 people use it. So no one was really using them at all. So in the 1960s, which the shot has taken, um, they really began to lose favour. So council had a policy, as they called it, to build only above ground. Uh, they were more accessible, more cost efficient. Um, stainless steel replaced the porcelain. The penny in the slot system went and replaced with the cheap sliding locks. There were just the little um, wooden doors, cheap wooden doors come on. But also changing social attitudes meant that people didn't feel like they had to hide so much um, of the toilets out of sight. And this um, shot here is just after 1965 when the Stout Star Fountain was put on and gifted to the city. So they were deciding whether or not to keep the undergrounds at all at this point in time. And after a four year period, they decided they would pushed the men's into the women's space and they shunted it slightly along. They covered all the skylights up with grass to make the star fountain look nicer. And um, that's where the toilets, and they all got completely remodelled and that's where most people will remember that they were there till 1989. And the railing was all taken out of that time too. So the underground conveniences began to disappear in the 1960s, which was a time period of um, great demolition in Dunedin. <laughs> um, Victoriana was not um, considered that, um, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, the local councils and government wanted to, uh, didn't want to put money into earthquake strengthening that a lot of these buildings needed. And as part of this movement, the underground toilets were seen as old-fashioned um, and not appropriate for use anymore. So this shows um, the Cargill's monument uh, newly planted out of a uh, flower bed. So 1960-61, the toilets were all part of the discussion to get rid of the Cargill's monument. It was officially signed off to be demolished, because everyone thought it was an eyesore and what was the problem with it. The public wrote in saying, don't destroy the Cargill's monument. And in the end, they thought, well, we'll just demolish the toilets, we'll keep the Carlos Monument, put a flower bed around it, and the traffic can go around it. So, thankfully, that's what they did. Coming into the more 1960s structures. So, in 1968, the Dunedin Rotary Club prepared a report titled How Convenient Are the Conveniences, which they then submitted to council. So, one complaint was of the lack of privacy and the, the small stall doors. And we've got this great quote of the vision of a row of half-mast nether guards is not a very elevating site for casual users of the conveniences. 
Uh, and so the other complaint was the terrible condition of the public conveniences. So there was an awful problem right from the go with vandalism. Um, it got worse and worse and worse. It's actually still the subject today why the Chinkford the Chinkford toilets have just been reopened, but that was one of the problems with them, as they were worried about vandalism. So um, council spent hundreds and hundreds of pounds every year fixing up the vandalism. They had the police checking them all the time, but could never catch anyone. Uh, teenage girls were the worst. They used their nail files and their nail polish to um, destroy the, the doors. Uh, so they could never catch anyone. If they did, they were made to pay back their damage. Um, absolutely everything was stolen inside the toilets. Uh, our cisterns, anything copper, our toilet roll holders, the toilet roll paper itself, everything was stolen all the time. So they had problems keeping them up. So this is a site of Bond Street. This is where they moved to after the undergrounds and exchange um, closed. And this is it. Uh, so this is the Bond Stock Exchange building. So this is the sad state of it as it's about to be closed. So the, the last um, underground was the 1989 Octagon one, it was the redeveloped the Octagon. So the roof was broken in and uh, the walls were cut down halfway and it was filled in and sealed with the rubble. So I recently had an anonymous note left for me at uh, work where they talked about um, someone must have been a contractor. They tried to take some of the white tiles out, but they broke. And they tried to get some of the marble out as well, but when it warmed up, it stunk. So um, they got rid of that as well. So some of the changing use overseas, for people who have not demolished this, um, this is a cafe. Um, you sit in the urinals and have your smoothies and coffee. Uh, this one you might have seen on one of George Clark's many, many TV programs he has. This is an architect who built her building and, um, her home in underground. So that's what she arrived to and she's done it up to live it. That was a huge hit. Uh, this is called The Convenience. There's another cafe um, in Hackney. You come down the stairs. Which brings us to our last remaining toilet in Dunedin. Um, this one is the 1912 Manor Place uh, Convenience and you may have driven past it many times. Um, it has both doors bricked up until very recently. We don't know when the last one was bricked up, but it was basically um, marked for demolition in about 1976, and then the transport department said, hang on, we might want to use it for our bus drivers. So they had a key for a while, and then after they stopped using it, it just got bricked up. We don't know by who or when. So anyway, nobody's been able to get into it for quite some years um, until now. So we've got into it. Um, so these photos originally were taken through the wee windows. It's never been remodeled, so it is the original um, state inside, which for me was very exciting. We've got arts and crafts tiles along the top, um, and all the original white tiling. All the original urinals from Twyford's are still all in there. So basically because it's been neglected so long, it's survived. Um, but you can see from some of these photos um, that sunlight coming through the cracks. It is extremely unstable what it's sitting on. Um, it's like being in a boat when you get in there. It's so um, wavy. So, uh, yeah, so it's um, massively um, damaged. So this was, um, had a conservation report done on it because we think it might be the oldest standing toilet in New Zealand in its original state. And so I'll just... Um, so this is from yesterday. This is me walking in it. Um, you can see nothing is even. Everything's sloped down side. It still smells a bit, even though it's been locked up for 30 years. And it's still got the original old system. It has had a few bits of um, where they've done it up, they've just chucked concrete in the spaces but they've never ripped anything out. <coughs> so you can see bits that have chipped off. And just to show you, that's the Twyford's branding. More cracks down the side. <laughs> and that one's particularly filthy. So that's the inside of that. I was very excited to go.
And so, whoop, so what I've developed um, as part of my work and going in my thesis um, is this 3D modeling doing virtual reality of um, the Octagon undergrounds. So in collaboration with the Tiger Polytech, we've um, developed this time travel where you can put on virtual goggles and you can actually travel through the underground toilets as they were. And we plan to develop them into um, augmented reality where you just need your phone. I had a wee play today, um, a student's doing some more work. So just to give you an, some shots, this is what you see when you're in the virtual reality. It's all white at the moment. So we've got the Thomas Burns um, monument and you negotiate your way down the stairs and you can see from this how hard it was to get down the stairs. They're very narrow and they twist all the way around. And um, just been looking at it today, a student has put the planting in and now you can click on the doors and shut the doors. You can turn the taps on the water runs. Um, so we're planning to have, uh, you click on bits and it gives you information, architectural information. Maybe me talking, I don't know about the history of it. And this is um, a shot of the Sydney men's conveniences being demolished because there's no photos internally of these toilets, um, hence us uh, developing the VR of just plans and some old photos. Um, we've got the specifications too, so that helps with measurements. But this is a, a show how elaborate they used to be in Sydney, and the city architect in Sydney is the man who built our first ones. And he went on to become the Lord Mayor of Sydney. But he was the one who fought and argued for our ones, and he, his name is often those original plans. So um, I've also got a website, uh, lulady.nz, um, with all my blogs, um, more information. I put up <coughs> pictures on that as well. Um, I'm also on Facebook as well. Um, and I'm still working through, so I'm halfway through the masters and just looking at all these reasons for the, um, the decline of these uh, superstructures. Why council put this huge investment when within a few decades they're out of use and not popular in any way? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Where did you my way to? What's that, sorry? Where did you all run away to? Uh, they had it all drained off down the <coughs> street. Yeah, yeah, all connected up. Yeah, that's the drainage, yeah. Is there any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Is there any planned reuse of the Carrot Street one that still exists? The, um, they're looking at options. Um, it might be in the paper tomorrow or on Saturday. I was going to interview Bobby today about all of this. Um, so they're looking at that structure underneath, uh, the stability of it, because it's not great. Um, but options could be whether they need to upgrade it and make it the toilets, whether they demolish it, uh, whether it's saveable, or whether it's a heritage structure that just gets shut off for a heritage point of view. Um, so they're just looking at that. It, it is not structurally, um, it, it's pretty had it. It's yeah. pretty had it, yeah. It's got massive cracks running through it. But, um, although I'd love it to be saved, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, do that, and you, I'm not sure if you can even save bits out of it because they probably just crumble. So, yeah, so but they're looking at all these options, yeah. So, this parts of the creation department, yeah. Were there any um, lamb trees in shops at this time? Yeah, there were department stores, um, but that was only for women who could afford to go shopping in the early days, and then those restrooms became really popular. So, there were two there's a George Street restroom one up Crooks Street and one at Botanic Gardens. So they were a lot smaller until the Athenaeum one was the big one that got built. But yeah, so they, they were the only options at that point in time, especially if you had children, but the only place you could go, yeah. yeah. What about the ones in behind the library there, the town hall? Yeah. Are they all gone? Now, or? Yeah. When were they? Um, there's always been toilets available. Um, there were ones that were shut down originally because when the Maori Place School was there, the, um, a window opened up right near the school, so the smell used to go through, so they shut those down. And then they've opened them up over many times. So the ones that are there now run with an attendant 24 hours, much like they used to in the olden days. So councils still run that 24 hour attendant one. It must be about the other one, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. 
But they also, um, a couple of years ago, they kept a record of um, their visitors and things that went on, and it's a fantastic social history. Um, and it gives you sort of an insight what the old tenants might have had to deal with, because they deal with a lot today. So whenever you're there, think of the poor tenants, because they have to do a lot of awful jobs. Um, but they, they befriend a lot of people as well. Like a lot of homeless people go there just for a chat, because they know someone's going to be there. And so it's quite a uh, social place, yeah, with sort of connections and stuff. But they used to do that, but they've stopped doing that now. I thought that would be great. They'd do that as well. I see there are horses in the pictures. What happens yep. to their stuffs? <laughs> um, just there were little. I've actually got photos somewhere of um, little boys used to go around. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. All those stuff. Yeah. What, what about these these little, those little standalone round um, toilets? The like the one that's over in, um, in the car park of the um, uh, of New World. Yeah, the oh yes. The doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Oh, uh, they're 1990s. Yeah, and so that is almost like a complete juxtaposition to what they used to be because, yeah, the doors open right up onto the street, as yeah. everyone knows and worries about. Um, whereas, you know, they're not even turning around the other way. So it's complete opposite to what they used to be, which is all hidden and secret. Now they're just like, yeah, here's a toilet. Um, and they open up. And so, like the new Baldwin Street one, um, if everyone's seen the Space Age one that's down there that's just been built, public toilet, um, that costs something like $90,000 to build one toilet. Um, and that's the sort of equivalent astronomical amount that they used to have to pay for the undergrounds as well to pick them out. So there's a lot of monetary investment. And, and that ongoing vandalism costs council a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Very good. I just wondered, did railway stations have? Um, limited, yeah. So we've got railway station ones, but um, there was a lot of complaints in the early days that there weren't enough for women. And so a lot of them just got caught short or you don't drink or... Um, just go where you can. So there is a lot of um, in the newspapers at the time of people saying there's no public facilities for anyone. If you're travelling from the car, well, where do you go? And, and a lot of the um, lot of them talk about visitors. It's, it's a problem for visitors because they can't find them. They don't know who they are. And where, you know, and as well as just the locals, but they, they're very concerned about visitors and out of town people not knowing where to go and getting caught all the time. So in the olden days with the big bell skirts, you just went where you were. Um, but as time went on, it was a bit harder. But yeah, um, a lot of women just didn't drink. You just didn't like when you go to a concert or a rugby today, you just don't drink. There's a couple that's toilets in Roslyn. Yes. The ladies' uh, ones associated with Mike or something? Yes, so that one was built in the 1960s, I think. So that was, yeah, that was in conjunction with Plunkett, and they had the men's ones underneath that. So that was sort of like in that modern 60s. Age and it was above ground, but they did it in conjunction with another organisation so they could afford it. Because they did start, once the boroughs started merging, all the boroughs wanted toilets as well, and so they were trying to provide for those as well. But they, there's a lot of letters every year saying, Oh, not this year, sorry, not this year, sorry, not this year. It goes on and on and on. Yeah. The, the, the new one in Port Charles looks like a Oh, yes, they've done it up. Yeah. It doesn't look anything like actual. Heritage choice, but it looks lovely. Yes, I took a photo of that when I was down there because they look quite nice. Yeah, yeah, they do. So it's a modern toilet with a sort of heritage facade. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, that they went to such expense to dig out and to go underground compared with the French solution, which was cast down to soir. And we never did that? No, not I haven't done it anywhere across New Zealand. Maybe we just went. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, they've never considered, we've got no discussion about those or anything, just, just underground was the thing to do. But that um, city engineer from Sydney, he was really sold on these undergrounds and he built the first one in 1901 in Sydney, and so he may have had a huge... So he wrote this great big report that outlined all the options. The report's gone. Um, can't find it anywhere, but we know there was one. So that's slightly frustrating because he put forward the options when the council voted on it. So he may have, but nowhere I've seen there's anything other than just an underground that is suggested. Yeah. Were there public baths? Were they city council and were they equipped? Uh, the, there was the ones in Morrow Place, but they didn't open until, I don't know, 1914, before they moved up to the White Moana Pool, so they were there for years. Um, I assume they had toilets in that as well, but these are just 
public and so a lot of hotels and that had to, toilets as well. And I know um, in the exchange area, people were sick and the hotel owners were sick and tired of people coming to use the toilet. The same with like in Roslyn and Mornington, they were like sick, the, the shop owners were sick of going, no, you can't do that. Yeah, so that sort of thing happened all the time. So that was some of the reasons they said, look, can you please provide more toilets where people are asking for it. But then as soon as they pick a site, someone goes, you're not going to here, um, which you, know, you wouldn't want them to decide to, but that's what happened a lot as well. How soon after settlement was the sewage system of the city put in? Um, a few, about, I think the first drainage pipes went in about 1859-60 down High Street for the Toitu Stream. Mm. And then over that sort of um, probably late 50s, early 60s, they're starting to put in drainage. Yeah, they, they struggled to get a city engineer for a start. So they're trying to put in gas lamps and stuff as well. Um, and all that, so that all that infrastructure is trying to be put in. And then um, they get in a lot of strop with the city engineer because he keeps wanting more payment, they don't have money, so he throws his toys out of the cotton, keeps going back to Australia, and then he keeps coming back. Um, so there's all that political stuff going on as well. And, and even just deciding whether they were going to put Princess Street, if it was going to stay or go, um, was a huge discussion that went for years. So they had the original plan, but when they got here they realised it was quite hilly, and not just cut through, so they had to cut through Bell Hill and put the street by hand, um, and that discussion about whether they should bother or not went on for quite some time. So they even just decided to lay the road before they even get drainage in. Yeah, so it took some time, but they, yeah, they got some in quite early, and then they spread it, it sort of expanded from there. Yeah. In your master's degree, you'll have a literature section. Is there a a, a broad lecture in the subject? Not a lot. There is um, a couple of other masters. There's a masters um, study in on the London ones. Um, and then Pamela Wood, I was just talking to you earlier, um, from Victoria University wrote the book Dirt on Dunedin Sanitary um, Health, which is a really good book if you want to read it. Um, and she did a PhD on that. And um, that mentions it slightly. But no, nobody's looked at the like why they disappear. Everyone looks at the establishment of them. And there's a lot of talk about the women's rise of the women's restrooms and the women, lack of women's, but I've taken it more from a um, sort of architectural local authority because obviously that's the records I've got. But uh, it's usually more gender um, bias the, the work that's been done. And yeah, not a lot of people have surprisingly done this before. <laughs> it's not like that, yeah. Is there much criminality going on with loitering and there is. soliciting? And there could be, but we have no record of that. Um, Chris Brickle um, mentioned some of that in one of his um, books recently. There is record in Wellington and I think Auckland, but I've looked up police records and there's, there's no detail about We know the ones where they're just vandalism because the council sent them the bill for what they've broken or what they've done. And then the only other thing I've come up with was about results on the attendance, um, which was quite a serious case, so they had more information on that as well. And the vomit, yeah. <laughs> that was a normal part of the event. Normal part. Yeah. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was the type of um, issues, but I'm sure there would have been, but I can't find any evidence. So your comment about um, the, the girls being vandals yes. is surprising. Yes. It wouldn't be surprising if guys were doing it, but women. Yeah, and they had to actually get a female constable on duty to go in there because the male constable couldn't. So, because they're always trying to catch them in the act, <laughs> and they never do. Like um, defacing it. Yeah, them. nail files, um, just graffiti on. Um, so there was that sort of behaviour, um, just breaking stuff. But then there was the people who actually went in and stole all the stuff out of it as well. So they always were replacing. But they said um, within like an hour of a couple of the um, toilets, they refilled with toilet paper. It was all gone. Mm -hmm. Some of them done and stole it. And then there was a case. Um, in the 1970s, of these toilets being totally vandalised, they couldn't work out who was doing it. I don't know how often they looked, but it turned out to be um, tramway trolley bus drivers who were upset they were going to lose their toilet, so they just had to just run, throw stuff around. <laughs> There's all sort of political stuff going on. Um, but yeah, so they're always right, and so the police, when they stopped having, because they stopped having attendance, which is one of the reasons two these women took decline, because um, there's no one there monitoring it, and this sort of behaviour happened. So yes, yeah, so there's a whole lot of kids hanging out in them, and, uh, but obviously you could probably hear the police coming, I don't know, but they never got caught together. It always evaded the police. Yeah. Is this 
Jesus. That was a rest of a really fantastic uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. Please join me and thank you.